All right, we can go ahead and start. So we're really lucky today to have Mr. Tata joining us and his right-hand man, Venkat, as well, who's worked with the Tata Group for a while. And uh, the structure we're going to do today is, uh, Mr. Tata, I wanted to give you a quick overview of what this class is. And then uh, a few of the student teams are going to give full presentations on their projects. And then the remainder of the teams will give just very short presentations so you can know what the whole class is doing this semester. So this class is called Global Engineering, and it's a graduate-level design class being offered in the Department of Mechanical Engineering and being sponsored, thank you, by you, uh, through the Tata Center. <laughs> and, um, and there's three core components of what we're trying to instill in the students in this class. And the first is an understanding of the socioeconomic factors that are unique to developing and emerging markets that maybe engineers wouldn't consider typically in their, particularly Western engineers, going through a design process. So we're diving into some development economics, market dynamics of these economies, looking at business case studies, and we've been very fortunate to get to have guest lectures by the authors of these three books, Poor Economics, Reverse Innovation, and Jagat Innovation. This is a graduate level technical class as well, so we're diving deeply into the analysis in theory behind the engineering systems we're looking at in developing and emerging markets. Uh, we're doing product teardowns, design for manufacturing and scale, and we also have some exciting technical guest lectures. Uh, we have the chief, te uh, chief mechanical engineer from GE Medical coming and also George Whitesides uh, who's a professor at Harvard that has pioneered low-cost diagnostics so he's coming this semester. And then the final part of the class is that the students are working closely with stakeholder organizations in emerging markets including Tata Chemical but also Jane and Irrigation, Mahindra in international development enterprises. And bringing together these three viewpoints the the students are working on term-long projects to create or improve uh, technology. And, and one of them that we're doing is related to the Tata Swatch, and, and that team will present today. But throughout the semester, the teams are developing their projects through four stages. A strategy stage, and those are the presentations you'll be hearing about today. A concept stage, figuring out the most critical part of that concept, and then bringing together a final prototype. And throughout all these stages, they're trying to think about all these three factors. So. What we're going to do is have two of the teams do full 10-minute presentations, and those uh, teams I would like all of you to, to rate on those rating forms, and we'll have a bit of Q&A. And the remaining three teams will do their very quick uh, two-minute, one-slide presentations, just a quick overview, and then we'll use the, the last half of the class for a Q&A with Mr. Tata. So why doesn't the SWATCH team go first? I think that's probably the most relevant, considering the audience. Um, so I'll bring up your presentation. Can we? Sorry, can we go yeah. to Google presentation? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, sure. Yep, yeah, certainly. And I think I, I've got that going right here. Cool. Here you go. Specifically, access to clean water is a global challenge. 780 million people live without access to an improved water source around the world. Also, if you include people that don't have access to high quality water sources, this number can jump up to nearly 2 billion, essentially one in every three people. So it's clearly a strong uh, difference between supply and demand. On one hand, you have nearly 4% of all deaths according, are responsible for waterborne illnesses. On the other hand, only 2.9% of households have access to these water filters. And while this is a problem now, it will continue to be a problem in the future, even though the UN in their, in their Millennium Development Goals has said that their goal is to half by 2015 the proportion of the population without sustainable access to safe drinking water. We find this a little bit difficult with the current solutions on the market because while most of the products give a flow rate between three to four liters per hour, from those water filters at a maximum, the daily requirement per person, per family, is two to four liters, meaning that a family of five could need 10 to 20 liters per day. Particularly in India, this burden is, is maximized. If you were to adjust the global world map 
by the population exposed to waterborne illnesses, India increases by 10 times, meaning that a solution, particularly in India, would be important. And this is where the Tata Swatch comes in. We've identified that the Tata Swatch is aligned perfectly with Tata's goals to provide an affordable and accessible water supply to all individuals, specifically in India. Yeah, and we're lucky to have uh, Mr. Tata with us today. I'm sure he's very familiar with this product. I mean, it was kind of his, his pet project um, as well. He knows well, and, and we'd like you all to know well, that the goal of the Swatch is to specifically address the needs in India. And um, to, so to address the needs of the people in India, we have, through communication with our sponsor, um, through reading uh, product reviews online on the Swatch, we've identified certain requirements which um, both our sponsor and we feel like are important things that the customer is going to want or, or currently has expressed want in this product. Um, so we have these kind of listed here, some of the most important ones, some of the biggest ones that we pulled from that group. And um, as you can see, well, there's many, many of these goals that we feel like the Swatch already does very well. Uh, there are a few of them that we feel like the Swatch has room for improvement, and that's what we hope to do throughout the course of this semester. So we identified six of these main design requirements, which we feel like have the most room for improvement, um, and where we decided to start looking for uh, the strategy that we were going to follow. Um, so these are here, and they're also on this, oh, okay, I'll get to that in a second. So our, our overall goal for the class is to improve the overall quality of the swatch by addressing one or more of these shortcomings. And as you can see from this chart, um, we, we in, in figuring out our strategy, we decided to make a list of each of these requirements, what the current state is, an, I, an ideal state where we would like them to be or where the customer would like them to be, and then we set a goal for ourselves which we felt like was achievable within the semester. Um, so these are kind of, these, these are actually really six different strategies, and we decided to analyze, we did some analytical work, which we'll get to in a second, to decide which of these strategies was going to have the biggest impact on this product uh, within the course of this semester. And as you can see, I've highlighted um, flow rate. It's a little bit highlighted. Um, because that's the one that we determined through analysis was, was the best marriage between the skills that we have um, here at MIT as engineers, as mechanical engineers, and what will have the greatest impact on the effectiveness of this product. And we want to take the flow rate, which is currently about four liters per hour on average, um, up to six liters per hour. And we'll show how this, this, um, this causes it to be more comparable or in the better end of filters that exist out there on the market today. And you can also see some of the goals stay the same, some of the requirements stay the same, but we also feel like reliability and capacity will be increased as we focus our strategy on the flow rate. Uh, this is because through communication with our sponsor, we learned that they believe that one of the main uh, problems affecting the flow rate of the, of the bulb is um, air entrapment within the bulb. They feel like there are bubbles that are obstructing the flow of water through the filter, and so that is causing a slower flow rate, but it's also causing reliability issues because it means that sometimes the, the filter allows water to pass and sometimes the, the passage of water is blocked. So we, we feel like through, through focusing on the flow rate, we're going to be able to also improve, improve reliability, and we're also obviously going to increase the daily capacity of the swatch filter, which is also important. So before jumping into the actual strategy decision itself, we had to first tear down the top half swatch. Uh, the first thing we did was actually was an overview of the swatch itself. So we have an upper and lower basin accounting for the capacity. There's actually an upper filter and then a lower filter attached to the bowl itself. And then based on the shortcomings that we identified through some of those customer reviews and talking to our clients was that the bulb is actually the main focus of this project. And so when we took apart the bulb by sawing off the top and looking at the cross section, we could identify not only the key dimensions as well as the critical variables that will, will be important for our physical analysis uh, and eventually our test setup as you can see right there. Um, so one of the first steps that we've taken so far is to try and model the bulb, uh, try and model the flow characteristics of the swatch. And as you can see, there are really three main resistances to flow that we can tackle. Major loss of course, porous medium, so looking inside the bulb, and, and minor losses, so looking at the geometry changes as the water passes through the bulb and into the bottom container. 
And really, we want to think about creative and non-obvious ways to de decrease these resistances and hopefully improve user experience uh, at the same time. So one of the questions that we're asking is, is our model actually correct? Um, so we've actually done a couple experiments to demonstrate that it's relatively consistent with, with what we would expect in terms of theory um, based on these, these uh, models here. Um, and the next question, of course, is uh, to verify how the swatch performs with respect to its competitors in the field. Um, so you can see here we've compared it to Purit, which is one of its main competitors, ceramic and siphon filters. So I just wanted to point out here that Purit reports a Floyd of 1.8 to 9 liters per hour. And so this is a relatively large range. And the reason is, is it accounts for both um, dirtier water, which will reduce volumetric flow rate, and cleaner water, water which will increase it. So we can imagine the range to be um, quite similar for, for Tata. So what we want to do eventually is try and see if we can increase this range so that the, media, me, the mean volumetric flow rate of the swatch is one and a half times its current. So really getting up to this range. Um, So that's it. I mean, you guys have any questions? <laughs> do you, where do you feel like the biggest gain can be made in the you know, losses that you're seeing now? Yeah, you know? so like, like we mentioned, we think that there's still air entrapment issues. Um, it's something that we're communicating closely with our sponsor about because they ha actually have just released a new iteration of their bulb, which addresses air entrapment. It's something that we're going to have to communicate closely with them to see if uh, air entrapment is still a problem. Um, as you can see on, on one of these previous slides, you know, Darcy's law, which is this middle equation, is actually our governing equation for flow through the, the porous medium. So there's a few factors in there that we can, we can try and adjust besides looking at air entrapment and other obstructions in the bowl. We can look at changing the pressure head, we can look at changing the cross-sectional area, um, the length of the bowl. All of the time that we do these things, though, we have to keep in mind that um, changing the dimensions of the bulb is going to change the cost. You know, if, they, if we make it way bigger, it's going to be more expensive, which one of our goals is to keep the cost the same as we're doing these things. So that's one of the things we're considering. We're, we're hoping to find, as we do some more experiments with the bulb, some low-hanging fruit, something that's obviously wrong with the flow in there that we can change and, and make a quick and easy improvement. Uh, a question about the daily capacity, I was wondering how, is that related to the number, because obviously it's not directly related to the flow, otherwise I'd assume the daily capacity is just how much the uh, flow can take by the number of hours. Right. Is that a, just the geometry, the volume you put in there, or is it you can refill it, but at some point the filter needs uh, to be recovered? So I think the intention was to have it be filled at only once a day. Okay. And so um, their goal is to really meet the one and a half liter per person per day metric that they set for themselves, which this does very well. Um, but you know, in terms of your user experience, maybe refilling it once or twice with a higher flow rate might actually be better if people want something faster but don't mind filling the bulk, filling the top container several times. So that's something we're definitely going to consider. Yeah. So the swatch has a nine liter capacity. So we're we're shifting basically from a one fill a day to two fill a day. So we, the capacity will go up to 18 liters per day. Um, and we're we're hoping to be able to show that it won't change the user experience too much to fill it twice if we can increase the flow rate sufficiently that it's not you know so much of an inconvenience. So you're not actually changing the physical geometry. No. At all. That's outside the scope. Our scope is focusing on the bulb and the flow so through the bulb. So it could be two fill a day right now if they used it all. Yeah, the it, it definitely can be. But the, the one fill a day was a requirement that, that the Tata group set for themselves. They, they felt like a family of five should only have to fill it one time a day. And so what we're suggesting is, it's kind of an abstract way of saying it, but what we're suggesting is if we increase the flow rate, maybe it's less inconvenient to fill it an extra time a day. So like in an abstract way, the capacity is increasing as well. That's, that's what we're trying to get at with that metric. Again, it's not the focus of our project. We're focusing on increasing flow, and we feel like that's kind of a, a lateral goal that can be effective as well. Why don't we switch up to the next? Oh, oh yeah, go ahead, Ventan. It was not necessarily the container since you're starting it. 
clean sheet of paper. Why should one constrain ourselves to this particular container? Start, start with the vision. Is it ideally you should be able to put that nano disk picture in any in any form, whether it's in a rural pot, it could be a normal earthen pot, some other type of device. That's one. And second, is past consideration still in talking? Like to comment on that. Yeah. <laughs> This price consideration was not 1400 or 900, it was 200. Mm -hmm. And it resisted. Uh, that price was being picked up from me. No, I, I probably was the biggest critic of this when it came out. It came because the uh, industry is arbitrarily priced at half of what the uh, most popular water filter was. And I thought it, instead of being at about a thousand rupees, it should be around 250, and that would really be disruptive. Uh, and the major part of the cost of the, the unit today is the container, which does, doesn't do anything but contain the water. And the and the proprietary part is the the filter capsule, which is re replaceable. So it may not have been the scope of what you have undertaken to do in, in this case, but one view might be to package the capsule, which is the guts of the system, and then separate it from and, and the collector after the filter as one unit and move the, the uh, untreated water as, as, another, as another element and no longer have a single uh, unit but split unit which you can raise head uh, by moving and uh, package the, the cartridge and the container as, as the guts to which you attach the the delivery of, of untreated water. And if you can then, as Venkat says, uh, utilize, being brash, but you can utilize a plastic bucket for untreated water with, with an, an output pipe, you reduce the cost because somewhere in the house there'll be a bucket. Hmm and uh, then serve the same purpose. And what you do in that case is get a low-cost model that's truly disruptive, that, that you multiply sales many times over in, in terms of doing so. Uh, it, it involves uh, kind of taking a clean sheet of paper and making it maybe a less elegant Product, but working working towards uh, serving the, the target that you that you want. Yeah, I think that's that's a great point. Um, in fact, some of the filters that we looked at the benchmark were just like you're describing. They're simply uh, a, a cartridge filter, and they use a bucket from the person's own house and a siphon to to create the filtration. So I'm actually in a unique position that my thesis focuses on the swatch as well. So that's not necessarily in the scope of this class project, but definitely something that I'm going to be considering long term when looking at the swatch holistically. Because uh, really what you're, what you're selling is uh, safe drinking water. And, uh, and here which, what I've been critical of data chemicals on is, has been the fact that you produce the container that looks nice and so on, but a lot of the cost is in in the container and, and the way it looks, which is working against you in terms of the volumes that you can sell. You're really selling this to the rural area where there's no, no power or could be with no power, where people have been drinking brackish water and bacteria filled water, you're giving them something else. So, and yet, 
the major cost of this and the packaging of uh, just everyday everyday materials is what the customer is paying for. And I've, I've felt that a good way to do it is to to decide what what is meaningful and 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 really work on that being the container and then give them a few options in terms of you have a bucket with a with a tap to which you can attach a plastic hose and then the guts is is the purifier and you replace the cartridge once a year or whenever you hmm. the cartridge is in fact uh, I think a hundred and fifty or two hundred rupees compared to the thousand rupees for think so I I need not to be critical of you I'm critical of, of what they did and I'm just conveying, conveying that to you I, I think what you're addressing in the scope of what you're doing is it's fine it's great Give the class a chance. <laughs> No, I think I think we should switch up to the next group. Do we have any groups that want to? Oh, first, yeah, nice job, guys. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And thanks. This is so great to get the feedback from both of you on this project. You know, it's yeah, you you're, it's, you couldn't make it more direct, right? That's that's excellent. And, and no, but. But the reason we do the presentations throughout the semester is so they can get feedback. You know, like right now they're in an early stage, just setting their trajectory. You know, so this is really great feedback. So any, do you want to go? All right. So the uh, this is actually tied in. The next group that's going to go is tied into another Tata centered sponsored project on irrigation that that we're working with Jane Irrigation on as well. So. There you go. So that's our one slide. Oh, that's your one slide? Yeah. Oops, sorry. Oh, no, spoilers. <laughs> Here you go. Cool. Alright. Hello um, and welcome. We are the drip irrigation pumping team. My name is Katie, and here we have. I'm Marcus. I started. And I'm Seth Simon. And we are working with Jane Irrigation on developing a solar powered pumping and buffer system for the drip irrigation. So the reason this is so important is that currently the rate of water use in India will exceed the replenishment rate by 2025. 70% of the water in India is used for agriculture. And the current uh, methods of agriculture for subsistence farmers include something like this ditch digging, which you see here on the right hand side. However, drip irrigation is up to 60% more efficient of, for the water use. And there are currently 800 million subsistence farmers worldwide. So if we could bring down the price point and allow drip irrigation to be an option for them, this would allow them to grow more, uh, better quality crops and have more reliable irrigation. So drip irrigation is certainly being done. Jane itself has a whole lot of you know, different drip irrigation products. But the disruptive opportunity here is to bring down the power that needs to be used for the drip irrigation, which is the most, uh, which incurs the most cost after the initial purchasing. So we want to use a solar powered uh, device that will power a pump and but in Amos's lab, we're also doing research on designing an emitter that will operate at 0.1 bar, or will act activate at 0.1 bar, which would basically decrease the amount of pressure needed in the system by a factor of 10, and thus the power needed by a factor of 10. So the goal for our project in this class is to design a solar plus pump plus buffer system that will give these desired flow rates and pressures for about $300 per acre. So our goal is to design a power system and pump that will give us a flow rate of 25,000 liters per day, will have low maintenance, and will be robust so it can survive outside in India. Um, and we want it to be within Jane's competencies, meaning we want to be able to use their products together or have something that we can retrofit that they can make. 
Uh, we also need it to be $300 for a one acre unit, and it needs to be work with a surface water source. And to figure out these design requirements, we made a flow model to determine our power requirements and how much pressure we would need at our pump. Uh, we created an energy model to determine how much energy we're getting from the sun throughout the day. And we've been doing pump and battery research to make sure these products exist uh, under our $300 mark. And with these, we've been making gallery sketches of ideas. And the first of those is a solar thermal pump uh, using a solar concentrator uh, hooked up to a steam pump. Um, we determined that this would take 125 megajoules and with the energy from the sun per day. Uh, we could do this with uh, between three and four meters squared of solar capture area. And this would be nice because it uh, would not require a natural pump, but it would require less moving parts. So the second strategy we looked into is the direct drive strat strategy, where you simply have the PV panels, the solar panels connected to the pump, and that would pump the water. So for this, we calculated that we would need about 1.8 meters squared PV panels and an 80 watt pump. However, the problem is, is that it'll only turn on when the power is exceeds this threshold. So it's a very specific number of hours throughout the day where it will run. So here's one of the analysis we did. You can see this orange line here, mark 25, which is the 25,000 or the 25 liters per hour we're trying to get. Uh, you can see we have a sweet spot right there at about 1.8 meters and the, uh, for the power we need from the pump. So this is uh, an example of the analysis we were doing for the energy to get the desired flow rates. Can you, can you just clarify that again, what, what that plot is showing? That's the electrical power out of the so panels? This is uh, so to explain the, the plot, the, the panel area is uh, the, based on a solar model and a rough approximation of what we can expect from PV panels, how much area of solar mm -hmm. panels that are used in order to generate electricity for the system. Uh, and the pump power drop is the amount of power that the pump is drawing, taking into account pump efficiencies and using the, um, in this case, a fairly simplistic equation of energy consumed is equal to pressure times flow rate. Um, and for each of those scenarios, we generate a contour plot that demonstrates, that tells you how much flow you're going to get over the course of the day based on our system model. Our modeling energy flows over the course of the day as sunlight comes in and the pump turns on at the points where there's enough wattage coming in in order to for it to run. So you can see that there's this point here, as Katie explained, where uh, 1.8 square meters of solar panels is about what we would need in order to run the system. And we would, and at that point, we would need an 80 watt pump. Uh, if the pump's too powerful, it's going to um, not run for enough of the day. And if the pump is too weak, it will run for a long period of time, but not move enough water over that period of time. And that's why you have the dip. Yeah. yeah. Huh. Cool. So the next question is, what can we do uh, by moving that energy around? Uh, a lot of energy is wasted. I'm going to jump forward. A lot of energy is wasted at the um, peak hours of the day and at the beginning and end of the day. Uh, if you don't have any way to capture that energy. So we, were, we asked ourselves, what could we do if we added a buffer to the system? Uh, and it turns out that the reductions are significant. Uh, it goes from 1.8 square meters required to run the system to 1.1 square meters, which is almost which is about 40% reduction in panels. Um, and panels are very likely going to be one of the more dominant costs of our system. Uh, it also decreases the amount of power to required from our pump. Uh, we only need to run our pump at 60 watts. Uh, which means that we can afford to run a cheaper pump with less copper inside of it. So, as, um, so this strategy involves, um, like I explained earlier when I jumped forward to this, taking the energy at the beginning and end of the day and accumulating that um, to start pumping earlier um, in the day, and then taking that energy that you're getting in your peak hours in order to extend how long you're able to pump over the course of the day. So we perform the same analysis, and it turns out uh, well, I already gave away the punchline earlier, but it brings down the lines for um, those uh, flow over the course of the day. And um, another interesting consequence of this awesome. is it begins to desensitize our system to the energy of our pump. Uh, it turns out that if we introduce a more powerful pump, uh, the battery is able to continue to turn the pump on and off and distribute that energy over the amount of time that the pump is running for. So you can imagine that if you have a battery, you can afford to have your pump run twice a day 
run down the battery once, recharge the battery back up, and then run it again. Uh, this isn't an ideal scenario because we're cycling our battery more frequently, which decreases our lifetime, but it does mean that the crops still get the water that they need. Um, this, this plot here um, actually comes out of a funny story with our partners. Uh, we were originally talking about batteries as uh, one buffer option, and uh, this uh, fellow, uh, Abhiji, uh, at Jane Irrigation was telling us you can't use batteries, they're unreliable, they run into problems, it's hard to get batteries. Um, he was explaining us the problems with maintaining wet cell batteries um, and how dry cell batteries are too expensive. Uh, and so we, we came back in the next meeting after doing a little bit of research and said, oh, well, what are your thoughts about a motorcycle battery? And he said, oh, those are great, but they're too small. Um, so these numbers here are actually for a motorcycle battery, uh, which, is, which is very promising. Uh, and not only that, but um, it turns out that um, the size of the buffer doesn't need to be that much larger than a motorcycle battery. Uh, once you start running a motorcycle battery, you've accumulated enough energy over the uh, length of the day to continue to run the pump. If you use a larger system, say one with three batteries, um, you're able to store more energy for a rainy day, sure, but it doesn't actually increase your performance on day-to-day -day basis. Um, this is an example of how you're able to accumulate that extra energy at the start of the day, distribute it over the course of the day, and then finally, about eight and a half hours of sunlight, um, begin, turn the pump off because there's not enough energy to run it anymore, and begin to accumulate electricity for the next day so that way you can get off to a strong start. <coughs> Oh, so our chosen strategy was the battery-driven system uh, with a solar panel. We get the greatest flow for the cost of the system. Uh, it's a lower risk and modular, so you can switch out batteries and pumps. And it hit our, all our flow and power requirements. So the next steps is we're going to build some, uh, design some models and build some prototypes to prove our concept. Uh, we're going to explore Jane's catalog a little bit more to understand what kind of products they have and what we can use, uh, and maybe what we can redesign. And uh, we're going to do more research on pumps, understand how to design them, and make more concepts. Yes, questions? Um, there's a few things I was wondering if you guys considered. First, uh, solar panels are really sensitive to temperature in terms of efficiency, so have you considered somehow doing a cooling system for solar panels and how we can keep them clean. So there's all sorts of different things that you can consider there. So in our discussions with Jane, Jane makes solar panels okay. that are used in India and they have the stated efficiencies of 14.5 to 17 percent. But in our discussions with Abhiji and Jane, he said that in about the last year they've been doing a lot more pilot uh, programs of training people about the cleaning being important and things like this which would fit in well with our system if they had to be trained about, you know, when to switch out the battery or things like that. Um, so that was something we discussed with him. And then have you guys considered simple solar tracking to get rid of so even more flat thing as opposed to uh, the arc? So the solar tracking is another thing we discussed. Jane also has uh, manual solar tracking. And one of the interesting things that we learned from Abji is that oftentimes, so if you have, you know, a field with the lateral pipes, and then this spine that it, you know, they're all, the pump pumps into the spine and then it all goes through the lateral pipes. A lot of times the farmers will sort of do the field in sections. So they'll, you know, wall off and do the first two rows and then come back a few hours later and change it to the second two rows. So we were discussing with Abhiji if it would make sense, you know, if they're coming back to the field every few hours to have this manual tracking. And that's something we're going to be looking at for price comparison versus gained uh, energy. If you, if you cycle a higher power pump, you'll get higher instantaneous flow velocities, right? In, in your lines, it, what's, the, what's the pressure drop trade-off for that? You know, you know if, you, if you pump for two stints of two hours a day rather than four hours continuously, you know, does that change things? Or, or you know, say eight hours continuously, so you have a much lower instantaneous flow rate. Uh, that, uh, do you remember the numbers were specifically for that? Uh, no, but I do know that Abdu was t uh, talking about they'd like to have something that is an all day, pumps all day, not yeah. sections anymore. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so our flow model, uh, we don't, I don't know the numbers exactly off the top of my head, but 
the changes, um, if you're only doing it once or twice a day, yeah. um, is pretty insignificant um, between like one or two or three times. Uh, the really important thing that we got out of the conversation was Object would really love, our partner Jane would really love to see a system that our farmers had to worry about less and deal with less. Yeah. Um, and if there could be a system that could just, the, pump, the farmer could turn on at the start of the day and would run over the course of the day and they don't have to worry about it for that entire time, it'd be just fine. Um, because with the traditional diesel source of energy that a lot of farmers use, they need to go out and manually turn that on and off and switch the systems around. Yeah. Um, and this can afford to run much more slowly over a longer period of time. So, so I think two things to consider is like if you do run a long amount of time, how much does that decrease your, your required power? And the second, too, is like if you have to start and stop the system, you have to recharge the line pressure, right? So you may get, that might lead to um, variations in water distribution. So it's something to think about. Okay. Great presentation. Uh, one yeah. question. Uh, so you, you mentioned a, uh, you can make the battery system larger so you can like, save more energy for a rainy day, you mentioned. Don't you want to save the energy for not the rain? <laughs> <laughs> Just clarifying. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't know. It's an overused idea in the solar industry. Yeah. Um, so, how, how much energy are you trying to store? So, like, how many batteries do you decide? Like, what's the cost of batteries? So, we are uh, storing about uh, 300 kilojoules of energy in one motorcycle battery is what we believe that, that target spot is. Um, a, because motorcycle batteries are really great for longevity and replaceability, um, and also because that number is about where you can start to run the pump once a day instead of needing to run it twice a day. Uh, so you only need one? Uh, how much does a motorcycle battery? Uh, motorcycle battery is... 40 to $60. Uh, as a percentage of the total cost of it. Uh, as, as a percentage of the total cost, it's about 10 to 20 percent of the cost in the United States is about 40 to 60 dollars. Yeah. Um, so we are expecting that it will probably be a little bit less expensive uh, in parts of India, considering how many people have used motorcycle batteries uh, and how widespread it is. Any other questions? We should probably switch up to the brief presentations. Thanks very much, guys. Great start. All right, so we can go in the order of the sheets. So the, the next three we won't be rating, but um, how about the bull key traction do their two minute overview? When you guys finished with the evaluation sheets, just pass it down in the room. Yeah. This is a sweet plot, by the way. I was like, when I saw that. Yeah. Oh, we can do a full screen. Cool. All right, second time I'm going to start before these guys get up here. All right, so we're the bulky teams, and it involves me, Anthony Wong, Murthy, Carmen, and Douglas. And uh, we were challenged by Mahindra to um, think about a machine to replace two bullocks. So you have people who, who currently have a small farm, and they, um, they use two, two bullocks to, to work their field. And Mahindra's thinking about, is there, can, we, can we make a small size machine that can meet their needs? And they're targeting a machine that is about uh, 350 kilograms in weight and uh, about 10, 10 horsepower on the engine. So uh, one of the first things we did to think about feasibility was we, we went through and looked at Mahindra's current lineup, which is this plot you see over there. So all the diamonds are their machine that they, that they currently sell. And um, for reference, there's a turtle or polynomial fit through that. And that little uh, square right there is where this bull key, where the, what they're targeting sits. So this kind of gives us some confidence that um, this bull key tractor kind of falls within Mahindra's current um, engineering capability and technology. You can imagine, right, that if something were out here, that would mean that we need some crazy disruptive technology to hit, you know, a super high power, low weight machine. But we're in a space that looks like it follows the trend and it just takes some stretching of what they've got so far. Um, so the, the model that we're uh, working on is the traction system. They largely haven't done uh, a whole lot with this yet. It's only in the concept phase. So we're focusing on how can you get good traction out of a lightweight machine. Cool. Thanks.
So why don't we why don't we flip through these so we get a full 40 minutes of Q&A. And I think maybe let's do the other two and then I think as we're switching into the Q&A with Mr. Tata, we can incorporate Q&A for these projects into that Q&A. Um, so the next one is the gen set. What's that? Yep. Cool. There you go. Thanks. Uh, hi, my name is Saurav Ghosh, and with uh, Jesse, Taylor, and Jasmine, we're representing the Andrew Genset team. Uh, so power capacity uh, has always traditionally been a problem in India, and it's led to a high demand for gensets, which are diesel-powered generators. Uh, and this is Mahindra's entry into a particularly saturated market. Um, Mahindra's genset in particular is a diesel in internal combustion engine sitting on a concrete platform, and the entire thing is enclosed by the steel orange canopy. Now, uh, if we can take a look at a uh, brief market analysis of Mahindra versus its competitors on two key uh, product attributes, that's the price of the gensets and the sound or the noise emitted by the gensets, we'll notice two things. Mahindra is not only cheap, but it's extremely noisy. Uh, and so to stay ahead of government regulations, uh, which Mahindra foresees is becoming increasingly stringent, um, they have tasked us to redesign the canopy to deliver uh, noise emission of 72 decibels or below. And we must do it at the same or lower cost in order to help Mahindra maintain its 54% market share in this particularly price sensitive market. Um, and so there's no trivial solution here to simply add uh, extra acoustic material. So we have to do more rigorous engineering analysis. And the way to do this uh, is we uh, looked into the equations and we found that uh, the two modes that are most important are vibration and transmission. And vibration is where the acoustic energy goes uh, from the engine into the concrete platform uh, and then in turn into the enclosure out to your ears. Transmission is where it goes from the noise source straight through the enclosure and reaches your ear. Um, and so um, in summary, what we want to do is address vibration first because it uh, leads to the largest contributions to noise emission. Uh, we need to conduct more tests, such as uh, spectral analyses, to find more relevant modes of noise transmission. And we need to redesign the vents because that uh, that were shown in the in the picture because that provides for pure transmission of sound. Cool. So with that. Thanks. And then the last one is the filtration project. Go. Okay, hi, my name is Allison and I'm working with Victor and Tim and we're working on the filtration of a drip irrigation system. So we're missing a picture on there. There it is. No. Okay, it's there. Okay, you'll have to be quick. Okay, so we're working on a drip irrigation system. So we were challenged by uh, IDE to increase the performance and reliability of drip irrigation systems. And so the drip irrigation team that's working on the power already talked about you know, what a drip irrigation system is to begin with. But one of the main failure modes that's encountered is clogging in the system. And although we've kind of overcome this problem with Western water, which doesn't have a lot of particulates in it, that's a real challenge for a lot of these microgrid communities. And so the way that this system clogs is usually by two mechanisms. One, uh, sand and other particulates from the source um, actually clogs the filter just because there is so much of it. And so that not only can clog the entire system, but that can ruin the filter and then people very often actually take that filter out so that the sand actually goes through to the emitter. And when the sand actually goes to an emitter, um, an emitter is actually just a very fancy way of saying tiny little holes. And so the sand clogs the emitter and can not only, of course, result in water not going to the plants and having um, that inherent problem, but it can also uh, result in the farmer abandoning this irrigation system entirely. And so uh, given that that's the challenge right there, and I don't have another picture for you, unfortunately. If you escape out of the presentation, I think you'll be able to see everything. We have the technology. Yeah. Um, there you go. There we go. Okay. So what we've decided to do is look at actually high volume filters. So filters that are already designed to take large amounts of particulate matter rather than the mesh filters, which can take very low amounts of filters, low amounts of uh, particulate matter. 
So we've actually investigated into different filters that don't actually try to prevent barrier or don't try to construct barriers to prevent the particles coming through. We're actually designing filters that actually use gravity. Use gravity and actually understand that the set the sediment that is in the water will actually naturally settle out on its own. And so rather than trying to create a better filter, we're actually trying to create a different system that will use a different approach to pull these particulates out. And uh, what is a little difficult to see is a gravity-based uh, filtration process, which doesn't actually include perhaps the settling tank, but actually uses the already existing pipes for the irrigation system to separate this material out um, and therefore deliver clean water to the rest of the emitters. Cool. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> All right, so why don't we switch over now, and Mr. Tata, could you come up front and we'll put two chairs up here. Great. So before the class, I had everybody watch your interview at Stanford Business School, I think a year or two ago, where you talked a bit about your career and uh -huh. decisions you've made. So that, that's, I guess, kind of their prep so far. And they've read other things about you. But I think, you know, I wanted this to be pretty informal where we could okay. exchange ideas and thoughts. So anybody want to open it up with questions? I'll open one up. I'll do one. Yeah, I'll, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're they're completely knowledgeable about the topic, I guess. Now, I think so. I think the nano is is a really interesting technology, and I think you know from from what I know about it, it didn't meet the sales projections that you initially wanted it to, and it and I think that was in part a marketing issue, not a technology issue. So it'd be great to hear about that. You know what happened there, and your thoughts. You know, I think in. In context, we we need to first talk of the the uh, they're not they man-made events, but uh, had nothing to do with the nano. We uh, we announced that we unveiled the nano in in a motor show in in Delhi, and the response was beyond everyone's. Uh, Thinking, we had about 300,000 orders, and everybody running around trying to get a nano. And around that time, this one lady politician in West Bengal, where the plant was, decided that she would not allow a single car to come out of the plant because, according to her, the farmers had not been adequately paid. We didn't, it wasn't our land, it was the government's land. Uh, and to cut a long story short, we had no option but to, at the dead of night, about two weeks before we started production, to move, up, move out of that plant. So we took all the dyes and fixtures, everything movable, took them out in, I think, several hundred tractor trailers. Uh, took the press shop, everything out at night, and over a period of time moved the plant to a new location in Gujarat. It took a year. By that time, the excitement on the car had sort of died down. The car was an old thing that had been announced some time ago. I mentioned that because I think that has had something to do with what happened. Uh, the mistake that was ours was uh, we had this great show, everybody was uh, complacent. We didn't have to s sell the product, we were sitting on orders. It, it would take two years to fulfill 300,000 orders, so nobody thought about what we needed to do. When we went, when the car came out, people were saying, well, I have to wait 15 months, 16 months for my delivery. I prefer to cancel my order. Uh, and we didn't do anything to, to mitigate that. 
what we should have done, we, sorry, we, what we did do is to put this through our normal dealers and sell it like any other car. What we should have done was to go to the concept that led to the Nano, which was to give an Indian family an all-weather transport and get him off a motorbike or a scooter with his family and put him in a Nano. So what we should have done and what we said we were going to do was to sell the Nano the same way as a motorcycle or a scooter got sold in the rural areas, in the rural markets, let an owner uh, go home with a Nano like he would with a motorcycle, um, get financing, get the Motor Vehicle Bureau to register the, the car, all first times for a car. Instead what we did was we put it through our dealers and it was sold against uh, the lowest cost car in India, which made this the lowest cost car and with it came a, I mean, a stigma that I don't want to be seen in the cheapest car, maybe uh, connotes that I don't have the money to buy another car. You put all of this together and uh, you have we, we started out with something like seven, eight thousand cars a, m uh, a month, which came down to four or five thousand, and just now it's on that, off that order, four or five thousand. In between, we had some thermal issues. We had cars catch fire. Uh, I'd like to say that a fair number of those were funny fires because in each case there were uh, there were cloth on the catalytic converter and then the catalytic converters at 600 degrees centigrade anything is going to burn on them there is no part of the process that had a cloth that went on the converter so somebody put something there but that was part of it when it burned and the engine compartment was hot and then the fuel lines melted and and then the car went up in flames. Those issues have been solved in many ways. The catalytic converter is harder, harder to get close to. The fuel lines have been re, rerouted and now we're going to a three-cylinder engine to to uh, upgrade the car. Hmm. So what you will see in the next few months is a three-cylinder rather than a two-cylinder, an 800cc engine against a 600cc uh, uh, engine, and a car that's more of a car than, than people had. With more features, we're having power steering and a few things that people have complained about, and we will relaunch the car. So, yeah. now I got I got a I got a question again. Selfish question about the, the Tata Nano because when I first heard about it and I heard the price point of oh about two thousand dollars, I said finally I can get a car, and I went online and looked up when it was going to be released in the U.S., and I got all these articles that called it a sub-$10,000 car, and I said, whoa, 10, what happened yeah. there? 10, that's what I was reading online, yeah. so I don't okay. know what the price, if that's if those articles were wrong or what the price point is going to be in the U.S., and I'm sort of curious, like, because there's, there's I mean, I know that we've, we've talked a lot about reverse innovation in the class. You bring it back to Western countries, maybe you can bump up the price of it, add some more features, but there's still a sort of marginalized market of poor graduate students who would buy a, you know, a lower cost car. Um, in fact, that's, that's what we visualize. Yeah. Uh, so I guess the question is what... In India, the in, in India, the car still sells, or well, right now the rupee being what it is, much lower than $2,500. <laughs> Uh, it, it will go up slightly with a three-cylinder engine, the, the base car will still be offered. Okay. Uh, for the U.S., uh, the more stringent uh, emission requirements and 
and for the US there has to be a redesign of the rear end of the car for rear end crash uh, requirements which are special to the US. The plan was still to have a sub $10,000 car and even what we're planning to have would be like around $7,000. Much of it is are the changes that I just mentioned. And uh, the U.S. has uh, made it almost impossible for anybody to import our car from, and you, you, you can't go to India and buy the car and bring it here, which you would get for $2,500. <laughs> <laughs> but that's... Uh, at that point, at seven thousand, then you're competing with like, if in my market, at least the sort of person I am, I would just start looking at used cars. Yes, so. that's 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 true. And uh, maybe a class like yours is to figure out what we can do to to minimize that forced upgrade. Uh, the UK and Europe have another class of cars that are city cars that don't need to meet some of these requirements. And I, I'd, be, I'd be very happy if, uh, if you wish to, to ship you a nano or two nanos and have your class go, go to town and work <laughs> <those things. laughs> They would love that. I would love that. <laughs> but I think, you know, that's a perfect project for this class. I'd, I'd and, be know, very happy. We'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, we can't do it. I'll do we're, my part, you do yours. We're, we're into the semester pretty far right now. We can certainly do it next year. Yeah, sure. But, um, it'll, take, yeah. it'll take some time to get through the U.S. bureaucracy to get the cars. <laughs> Jay Leno has one. I know, it yeah. took a year to... Sh really? <laughs> <laughs> huh. Yeah, he doesn't, it's not registered. It's just and he, they won't let him register, and you're not going to register it, you're going to do things with it. Yeah. yeah so. <laughs> That's a great deal. Okay. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll talk to you about the details. And, Excellent. And we'll, we'll gift you two nanos. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. The one good thing about the price is that they're easy to give. Yeah. <laughs> no, I said nano. <laughs> no f types? No. <laughs> yeah. Um, who do you see as the major players in the Sorry? Who do you see are the major players in the um, technology for the developing world space? Major and players in like technology for the developing world. There, there aren't any. There aren't any to, uh, today. Okay. Uh, some interesting things happened. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of doubters uh, who said it couldn't be done, and when it did get done and the troubles happened, they sat, sat out through that period of time mm -hmm. and we were very content to use our experiences that they made a car but it didn't work mm -hmm. and stayed with, with the price uh, positioning they had. I think the closest that will come to 2,500 is Renault. Yeah, They're designing a low-end car in India. Um, there may be some degree of subsidizing it, which is understandable. But I think their car will probably be uh, around three or four thousand dollars. There and. And Daihatsu is going to be another one that's going to come out with a car that will be uh, a stripped down Daihatsu, which may again be of that kind of price line. More like, but more generally speaking, like how do you see this sector, like development technologies, like changing as of today? How how do you see the how do you see this sector of development technologies changing? Not just specific to auto. You see, the car companies are are fighting for margin. They would be very happy to to cut out this sector as as it is. They have come down to four thousand 
uh, dollars and they need to be in there because the, that sector has grown enormously, not 2,500, but the low end sector has grown enormously. And uh, the Chinese are not as yet looking at a car in that price, the price class, but the people who are in India are looking at competing with this and looking at the developing world, you know, Africa, Indonesia, places of, of that nature. That I think unless, uh, let's say that we succeed at what we're trying to do and we relaunch the car successfully and we get a decent market share, then I think you will start to see somebody exercising themselves on how to get below that. But right now everybody's in a comfort zone of, of not having to go there. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. A term that I keep hearing used more and more in the uh, space of developing markets, um, and I think that is um, aspirational technologies or and aspirational design. And I think the, the Nano and the Swatch are both uh, great examples of uh, projects that use aspirational design and aspirational marketing and built these aspirational technologies. Uh, and I was really curious uh, if I could, if we could hear your definition of what makes, what you think makes something an aspirational design uh, and advice on doing that. I'm kind of the wrong person to ask that because what I thought would be a tremendous aspirational product, namely the Nano, to give a car to anybody in India that wanted one, and then to have, uh, you know, a slap on the face and say, well, we really don't want to be seen in the cheapest car. <laughs> uh, my neighbors don't want to see this parked in my driveway because perhaps I will be seen not to be able to afford a higher price car and that I will go for a used car that's higher in cost than this because I will be seen to be that would is a reaction that I never anticipated. Uh, what I did find which is equally surprising was there are more women that have bought nanos because they claim their husbands have not allowed them to drive their car and that they bought this with their own money and it's, it belongs to them. It's equally much is a surprise but I think we we position it wrong and it could be an aspirational product uh, and I think what what we need to do is to create uh, versions of this in, in different segments of that market so that someone could say, well, I have a Nano Deluxe, which is not the cheapest car. And aspirationally, I think uh, an, Indian, an Indian would like to be seen to be a person of means. And uh, I always thought a car is one item of aspirational ownership, another is a house, and, and that goes with all of this is a, a bit of showing off. So if you went to South India you would see homes that have marble, wood, granite, uh, steel, uh, all kinds of materials to show that I have, I'm a person of means. So uh, I think image is the big thing on an aspirational thing, more than the aspiration of actually owning. It's showing off to the rest of the world that I can. Hmm. Do you think that's something unique to India? or is No, I think it's to the developing world. Yeah. And yeah, what I'm trying to say, it's not that I have a car, but I should be seen to be in a car that someone says, oh, he has that car. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, so that I had a question about the advice that you would give uh, a budding entrepreneur who wants to enter this bottom of the pyramid area. Like, uh, I mean, that for you guys might be able to afford some hits on the nano and switch, but then for somebody new entering that segment, 
like, I mean, if you see these resistances, then that will be the end of the whole company. So, what kind of advice can you give people like that? What kind of advice for entrepreneurs entering this bottom of the pyramid area, especially in places like India? You know, I, I, the thing that took me to looking at the bottom of the pyramid is is basically if you did that and designed products to cover the bottom, you have a market of about 600 million people against 250 or 300 if you didn't. And if you were able to successfully reach that market correctly, and I've tried to express that we made a lot of mistakes in how we did it, uh, I think the you exponentially increase the size of the market and the opportunity that you have if you priced it correctly. And I think disruptive pricing is also part of the required formula to address that, that segment successfully. Hmm. Yeah, Jesse? Uh, can you talk about what other parts of that formula so you've mentioned disruptive pricing and some of this aspirational sort of image conscious stuff, but what other factors do you think are important when you're looking at a total product um, that perhaps you haven't talked about yet, like from your learning from like the Nano and the Swatch yeah. and these other products? See, I think you just can't look at the product, you have to look at the total uh, customer experience. I tried to mention that if it took you three weeks to register a car, it should take you one day to register a nano just like a motorcycle. You should have financing, you should have, we, we talked about servicing the car by, by hiring uh, unemployed people that we trained as service engineers, we gave them a car, we gave them a, a number of uh, customers that they would service. Mm -hmm. We didn't do all those things. Mm. Uh, we got uh, distracted first with the, uh, the moving, moving of the plant and then uh, getting the product out and it wasn't going the way it should. But initially our plan was that we would create the first plant, then we would create a small uh, low break even assembly plant that we would uh, have peppered around India, giving a chance to young entrepreneurs to to set an assembly plan. We would run their quality assurance, we would train their manpower, and they would produce the next wave of cars. They would also be a, a source of repair facilities for these uh, service agents that would serve customers. And so the customer would get a different experience from what he would get as in, in a normal car. And if we had succeeded in, in doing all of those things successfully, I think we would have given uh, them a better, better aspirational experience. I, I can only make a, a comparison with Tesla, for example. Uh, where the Tesla owner buys a car but he gets different experience, the car is plugged in, it can be diagnosed uh, over the net, it can be, the software glitches can be fixed while the car is in the garage, in, in, in the customer's garage, mm. uh, where, where a loaner car can be given to the customer and if he likes it, he pays just so much and can take the higher end model. There are a whole host of things that Tesla have done that they didn't have to do. It could have been just another electric car. Uh, so I think aspirationally, those kinds, going beyond the product to the, to the overall experience that is more than what he gets is is an important ingredient to to make this work. And I think more and more uh, disruptible products should also have other things packaged in it that make the experience different. And add value 
to the customer. You know, the perceived value. Yeah. Yeah, I really appreciate you you stressing that point that you know there's a technology, but then there's all these secondary and tertiary effects yeah. that affect its success. That's right. right. And, I, and I think that's something we've discussed a lot in this class. I'm, you know, we're really trying to instill this in the students. Yeah, yeah to think broadly. Allison, you had a question, right? Yeah. Um, Can you speak up? Oh, sure. So I was wondering if you could re-release the nano, what would you, like, it, let's pretend that it never You know, I have, uh, if, if none of what I said took place. Yeah, uh, if you knew what you knew now and the nano had not yet been released, like he's like five I, I would have really uh, done what I just described. We would have had a different form of sale that would have been oriented towards, we wanted a card that would be oriented to the rural customer, to the college student. Uh, we wanted to have an image of a young, trendy product that that would be fashionable to drive in because it was trendy, but we didn't do any of those things. Uh, and uh, instead, instead, the customer ended up feeling he just got the cheapest car. Is there any technical feature that could have changed the aspiration level of the car? Yeah, there are a lot of related things. For example, if we wanted to address this to the young college student or or the the young customer, even the colors of the car were were middle middle aged colors, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, there's nothing that made the car stand out as as being. Uh, there was one, uh, what everybody calls the papaya color, which became the mainstay of the car. It makes it stand out, but the rest of them were uh, silver gray, white, blue, uh, powder blue, and so on. So the car kind of became became a car that was like any other car. I am quick to say that unless we make enough of a difference to relaunch this car, just looking the same way is not going to be such an easy task. We have a completely new, new car, uh, which we displayed in Geneva some time ago, which could be the Nano 2, if you might. But we need to do something till that comes uh, comes out. And that would be uh, a car with scissor doors, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> it would be it'd be different. Hmm. I, uh, I I'd like to ask a question. Um, a lot of the the business innovation and technology innovation for emerging markets that. I hear about and the students have read is very much how Western multinationals can more effectively engage emerging markets. And I think, you know, you're certainly, I guess you're all perspectives, right? You know, the talk has been around in India for over 100 years, yes. but it, it, under your tenure, really expanded globally. So I would like, I'd like your viewpoint on what do you think Tata's direction is going to be both domestically in India and worldwide in the coming years? Well, I can't tell you what it's going to be. I can tell you yeah. what I hope it will be. <laughs> uh, um, I think I think Tata should continue to to look at at markets and and activities outside India. Not forgetting India, but but I think we've come to a stage where we can theoretically look at acquisitions that makes sense to us, not just to grow bigger in size, mm -hmm. but because uh, they represent product areas where we have a gap, or, where the, or, or in areas where there's a technology that we couldn't effectively, uh, realistically absorb <coughs> ourselves. 
and uh, or countries uh, in Africa and places like Indonesia, Malaysia, etc., where many of our products uh, could be tweaked to address those markets quite effectively. Uh, oh, by the way, one area of a relaunch for the nano is going to be Indonesia. They have no product that is anywhere near that in terms of price or what we what we learned from the mis mistakes we made for nano in India, we could really try to undo by addressing a country like Indonesia, um, we, which is today a two-wheeler country. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that what we should look at is integration of, of the products and the product areas we have in India into, into uh, those other markets. Another area is that India is just opening up in the uh, allowing defense and aerospace to be in the private sector in India. And unknown to most people, Tata's have the largest private sector activity in, in aer aerospace structures. We do the fuselage for the large uh, Sikorsky helicopter. We do the, we're the sole source of the tail empennage for the Hercules freighter, mm -hmm. the Lockheed Martin freighter. We're, we're, being, we're talking to uh, Airbus about uh, troop replacement aircraft in India. And there's no reason why we can't look at expansion of these activities to the same kind of countries that we, that we talked about. And um, Jaguar Land Rover is building a plant in China, uh, is uh, looking at uh, an activity for re remanufacturing a new Defender in Saudi Arabia. So companies we acquire may also have an ability to, uh, to grow in other countries. As far as coming to the United States, uh, the United States is a very demanding market and I would say that until we establish ourselves in, let's say, Western Europe or something, I would be careful about coming to the U.S. and failing because I think that failure, there are long memories to, to failure in, in the U.S. market and until we are sure that we could be a robust company backing up our our products with service and support. We shouldn't come to the U.S. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, um, Rob. So, uh, aging populations is a global problem. Uh, even in developing countries, uh, where living standards are rising, uh, and I'm interested in markets particularly such as India, uh, which are undergoing social change, such as uh, moving from the extended family format uh, that you might see in like popular Indian soap operas uh, to the, the nuclear family format that you have in uh, more commonly in the developing world. And also with the forces of globalization, you're seeing these families split up uh, across the world. So my question was, what are the challenges of aging populations in India? And do you foresee any business opportunities to address these challenges? What are the opportunities in India? So, the first part was, what are the challenges of aging populations in India? And do you foresee any business opportunities to address these challenges? Well, in, I think in, in order to uh, just put some framework on this, we need to realize that India is producing 17 million new Indians every year. That's one Australia, one Malaysia each year. Uh, so we're, go we're going to have, and 40% of the population is under the age of 25. So we're going to have a very young population 
with great aspirations of you have connectivity, you have skills, you have education. So I think the aspirations of young Indians is going to be high and we need to fulfill that. Uh, so the truth is I believe the base of the pyramid is very, very important for the India to, uh, that is the future India. At the same time the challenge is he's going to, he or she's going to be well connected to the world knowing what is available and what to, it's, it's not a protected environment any longer. And the new customer is going to have the opportunity to choose. So any, we, we've gone through 50 years of the market taking whatever manufacturers give. And that's changed. And those of us who don't, don't realize that will find ourselves out of business. So I think we have to look at, not look at second class products for the base of the pyramids. They have to be products that we ourselves would not be ashamed to, to use as, as sophisticated buyers. I think that's really the challenge. And uh, I think if one meets that challenge, it's going to be a great opportunity. We, we have to end in just a couple okay. minutes. But I want to, I guess I want to pose one last question that's really relevant to these students. Um, most of these students are not from developing or emerging markets, but they care very much about that space. Yeah. They have great technical training. What do you think is the greatest value added to this space that, that students like these can provide? You know, I, I mentioned this to you when we first met in that smaller group. That what strikes me about what what this is all about is that there is a, a commitment that I have seldom seen in the United States to do something that makes a difference to the other part of the world that that is going to be the most important part of the world, not for any reason other than the fact that it contains the most people. And and I think what, what you're doing is going beyond uh, an issue of just looking where, where the monetary opportunities or the wealth creation opportunities are to areas where perhaps at some cost to yourselves are going to make a difference in a meaningful difference in the world, bringing technology and the application of your skill sets uh, to that part of the world. And I think that's been an issue that's hit me in the face as making you, all of you very different from ev everyone else I've seen. Hmm. That's exciting. Well, I think we should wrap it up. Okay. Thank you very much Not for coming. Yeah, well,